This week on Bloodstream, more mice with hemophilia are being tested on poor things, though I thank them for their service, and this time with non-viral gene therapy. We'll bring you the latest data along with what this could mean for the future of hemophilia treatment. Plus, Natalie's back. She's here to talk shop with us 38 weeks pregnant, and we'll also be joined by community member and musical talent Tamar Mitchell to talk about growing up in a big house, a musical house, and how those impacted his experience of hemophilia. Maybe I don't love myself or something like that. Like that's that's the type of energy that I was feeding myself. And I had to like take a break and like reevaluate myself. So it was just like, it was a heavy time. Hi all, I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your other host, Amy Board. Also I'm here today and I'm Natalie. A quick reminder that none of us are doctors. That is true. Though I flirted with med school and I oftentimes suggest to Patrick that I can perform surgery. One, that doesn't count. Two, that always scares me. And three, anyway, you listeners, please just talk to your doctor before you make any healthcare decisions. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to us, tell a friend, and hey, welcome to Bloodstream. Uh, this is a big week for Bloodstream. We got Natalie back, which is always exciting. We got cool data. We got global updates. We also, it's a big week for Bloodstream Media, too. We had Christy Van Horn from Flow on Cheat Codes with Mike and Amar to talk sickle cell reproductive health. So there we got a nice little crossover of women's health and sickle cell mm -hmm. health and bloodstream media Kabah. so anyway lots to get to but first dear listeners i want you to know that the bloodstream podcast is made possible by our presenting sponsor takeda yes that's right takeda they have a website you may have heard of it bleedingdisorders.com where you can learn all about takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Resources for people affected by hemophilia A, hemophilia B, inhibitors, von Willebrand disease, and much more. Takeda is committed to a world free of bleeds and to building upon the Baxter and Shire legacy, and they believe that together we can continue to develop and deliver more innovative, transformative treatments for people living with bleeding disorders. You can learn more by visiting bleedingdisorders.com. One more time, that is bleedingdisorders.com. And for their founding and ongoing support of the Bloodstream podcast, I would just like to say thanks, Takeda. Thank you, Takeda. Now we have to get to Natalie. I can't wait. I'm just dying, dying to know how she's doing. 38 weeks. I feel like it could happen at any minute. How are, how are you doing, dearest <laughs> friend? Oh, my gosh. Well, so my prediction is that it was going to happen tomorrow. I've been predicting that for a while. But now that tomorrow's tomorrow, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, this morning she was like, are we going to have a baby tomorrow? <laughs> we have um, bonus time? Yeah, so I think I want some bonus time, but it's it's not up to me. It's up to this baby. But 38 weeks, it's here. And uh, yeah, at any time now. Tomorrow is the full moon, which Ooh. out of all the days of the month are the most is the most frequent that babies are born. Which is just interesting, right? A little, yeah. a little woo woo. Um. <laughs> For listeners, we're recording this on Wednesday. It comes out Friday, so we're describing Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so maybe by the time this podcast comes out, there will be a baby. But now that, um, yeah, that that is <laughs> imminent, I'm a little bit like, ah, well, two more weeks sounds nice. <laughs> How are you doing? How's your walk? Do you, are are you walking? Or are you waddling? Are you full blown waddle? I I think I'm still Patrick. What do you think? I think I'm still walking. I think you're still walking too. Yeah, you're mostly walking. There's a little side to side action, but it's a, a mostly sway. walk movement. More of a sway than a walk. Slight it's a sway. sway. The gait. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. Do you remember how pregnant Rebecca Haber was when she joined us on Bloodstream four score and seven years ago or whatever, <laughs> Natalie? <laughs> I mean, I think she was within days or weeks of having that baby so yeah because i remember she said she she's like yeah i can come over and um a small yeah. planet showed up at our house like, yeah oh, you're, are you going to the hospital next small planet <laughs> um but yeah i i feel really good which is why i think most people at 38 weeks would say like i'll have the baby tomorrow mm -hmm. but i have no pain i have no aches i have no i mean i i like i'm I feel a little embarrassed saying this because I know so many people struggle at this point and are just like so miserable, but I'm feeling great. So I don't mind being pregnant um, That's great. a little bit longer. 
But yeah. But to your credit, you're also doing the work too. And I think that's important because it can sometimes feel like doing the work doesn't bear out the results that one may want. But I think your pregnancy is an example of one where like you're putting in the work and it seems to be going pretty well. And that's not always going to happen. But if, if one puts in the work, they at least give themselves as good a chance as possible. So to your credit, I do think they're, I don't think it's totally, you know, random that it's gone well. I think you're doing good stuff. What's yeah. putting in the work? What does that mean? I mean, is there extra work? <laughs> To um, cook in a baby? <laughs> I mean, just eating well, drinking a lot of water, exercising. Mm. I went on a five-mile beach walk yesterday, mm. um, which I know is just not possible for everyone at this point. You know, my sister has sciatica, and there's just things that prohibit those kind of things. But um, mm-hmm. if you can, and if you keep it up, I think it leads to a much easier pregnancy and a much easier delivery. So I'm feeling great. Plan to walk again today. I've been going to the chiropractor weekly, and I'm, uh, mm. I, I've definitely mentioned on this podcast that I'm a huge fan of chiropractic work. But um, yeah, so I think doing the work is just like really not just being like, I'm pregnant, I'm going to like lay back, eat everything in sight, not take care of my body. Like it's, it's a time I think where you should be taking care of your body more than anything. Um, so yeah, and then, and I'm just like setting up our space too. Like I have, I'm, I'm looking over at it, this like giant affirmation wall that uh, friends and family have sent beautiful, beautiful things. Um, and yeah, it just feels. Let's like put I'm, a picture of that up. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a good picture of it. You know, Natalie, we definitely want to ask you some questions about Save One Life while you're here as a board member um, to get an update on where Save One Life is at. But, you know, a number of people responded to um, a tweet that I had sent to someone that you and I speak of frequently in the Lynch household who may share a doctor with people in the Lynch household. And I was wondering if you could give us the like uh, 90 second story as to the the birth journey that's run in parallel and uh, some of the comedy that we have enjoyed as a result. Uh, so Chrissy Teigen and I shared a doctor during this pregnancy. Um, she had she had a, a chi- uh, infant loss, um, uh, I think, halfway through the pregnancy, which was really sad. But she um, and John definitely appreciated their doctor as much as we've appreciated our doctor. And for Christmas, they made an action figure of him for him and posted it online. So (laughs) there... This is true. ...is an action figure of uh, Dr. Stephen Rad out there in the (laughs) world. Um, And we love him. He's, He's a great OBGYN here in Los Angeles. Um, and last, the last visit we were there, we were like, so where can we get our Dr. Stephen Rad action figure? But I think, uh, Chrissy and John only made one. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, last week Patrick, uh, went for it and tweeted at Chrissy and she responded. Um, wait, so, what? Yeah. I, what, wait, what? <laughs> I missed this. I'm, uh, I'm very, very like I'm into Twitter and I'm also like, you're, Patrick, you're the only person I react or I respond or <laughs> cut this out, Greg, but you're the only person. I'm, no. I'm flabbergasted. No, it's all staying. We'll make Dang sure that we it. show it to you. But that's that's why I wanted a few people were like, wait, how? What, what is this about? So I thought this would be a good opportunity for Natalie to explain a little bit. It made Patrick's weak year. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Century. Um, yeah, she's legit feel funny. Free, feel free to continue with this podcasting thing. I'm going to go on to <laughs> Twitter.com. Not not only do we share an OBGYN uh, <laughs> with with the Tegan Legends, but Patrick also shares a birthday with Chrissy. Same date, same year. So, you know, they're like... A lot in common. Yeah, like cos- common. cosmic twins. Um, yeah, it was it was time to make that connection happen. But the thing that I, that I just loved when we saw, and you can go to um, Chrissy Teigen's Instagram if you want to take a look at the Stephen Rad action figure, is that you don't make an action figure of your doctor unless you're having conversations similar to the ones that we were having when we would leave him about like, wow, that guy is some doctor, huh? What an experience this place is. There's no way. So it's just a joy to know that um, <laughs> other people and people who have the means to go ahead and make custom made action figures of folks in those situations had a similar reaction to that we did. So <laughs> also if you want to see the action figure, you have to go to Dr. Rad's Instagram because Dr. Rad, oh, not Chris, Do- Dr. Dr. Rad's Steve, Instagram. Dr. Steve Rad, I believe is the handle. Um, he posted. That's appropriate. His, Dr. Rad. Are you kidding me? That's he's amazing. Right? He's totally you know, rad. I'm, an earth science I'm still on twitter.com by the way, still on twitter.com. <laughs> like do, do your jobs. <laughs> All right. Well, actually, you know what? Yeah, we've spent while Amy is doing whatever she's now doing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Natalie, let's chat. And actually, I, I haven't asked you about this either because I haven't spoken to you since your last board meeting. Um, but Save One Life listeners obviously by now know what it is, the global nonprofit serving our global hemophilia community. Um, but can you give us a little insight as to what's going on at Save One Life to start 2021? What's the board thinking about? What can listeners maybe be aware of or do to support? Obviously, COVID affects uh, our sponsees. Our sponsors, um, you know, the economic effect of COVID has um, played out in Save One Life as it has, I'm sure, other nonprofits as well. Um, And these children who uh, often have families with low means, um, some of those jobs, especially jobs that relate to tourism, are really, really affected. So this Mm, is at this time, um, sponsorships mean more than ever. Right now, there are 49 kids awaiting sponsorships, and some of the challenges that the organization's facing is typically the way we get it out over social media or the internet. Uh, People are having internet burnout. People are social media burnout. Like, we're just doing everything. We're Zooming all the time. So the posts aren't getting the traction that they got before. The website's not getting the traffic it was getting before. So... um, you know, if if you are a listener and you have the means to sponsor a kid, I would really, really love you to go to saveonelife.net and pick a child to sponsor. And if you don't have the means, if you see a Save One Life post that I post, that the organization posts, not only liking it, but sharing it. But another thing um, with social media that puts posts in other people's algorithms is if you save the post. So that is the most high prioritizing social thing you can do and on instagram it's taking the little flag in the bottom right corner and hitting it and saving it and it goes to your collections i I have collections somewhere i don't know where (laughs) um and then on facebook it there's three little dots on the top right and you click that and the first option is to save so more than sharing or liking or loving or commenting saving um makes these posts show up more often so if you can't sponsor a kid uh by doing that, it's really helpful to the organization. So yeah, that's kind of our focus right now. And I know this is a extremely difficult time for all of us. You know, this pandemic is unprecedented in our you know lifetime, and it's very difficult. And just sitting here listening to you, Natalie, and just thinking about it, you know, this this would be a wonderful way as a family, as a couple, with a group of friends, um, to almost serve others more than yourself in a time that might really boost um, spirits, trying to, you know, give back to corners of the world that we don't see every day. Um, because I think the struggles, um, you know, the struggles that we don't see every day are the struggles that we don't see every day. And so I... I I just just thinking about it, I think that's a really lovely thing and really wonderful to bring up in this particular time. Um, it's so difficult and this this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to give back and to feel good and to connect with somebody um, in a country that you know we don't it, it'll be a, a window into that culture into that that life experience. Yeah, and I, I think outside of helping get them life-sustaining medicine, Um, for their bleeding disorder, the sponsorship money also goes to nourishing food. And food insecurity, while it is definitely a thing in this country, um, it's next level in in a lot of these places where where these children are. So, you know, when you're enjoying your uh, DoorDash or Seamless or grocery delivery and, you know, talking about things going back to normal, like some, some child out there with sponsorship is getting is getting food and medicine. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely um, and 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 to help with the mental health here. I feel like when we serve others, our mental health improves. So if you're kind of in a slump right now and, and trying to figure out how to get your spirits up, um, giving is a great way to do that. So thanks, Amy, for saying that. Natalie, how many uh, children is Save One Life currently seeking sponsorship for? Um, right now, there's forty nine. Uh, unsponsored children so yeah okay 49 children and and people if they go to save one life.net right there's like little profile icons you can click to learn a little bit more about the individuals i think i haven't actually been on the website in a, in a couple months yeah you is can, that right you can see a picture you can read a little bit about their story if there's a country that connects to your heart 
Um, you could choose a kid from that specific country. Um, so, and, and then once a year you get annual updates on how the child's doing and how, where the money went to. And yeah, if, if it was education, um, sort of their health update as well, how many bleeds they had and, um, it's pretty, Natalie might be the one writing that update for you. You never know. <laughs> Very possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so. And thanks for providing that social media hack as well. Now we've all learned that the best thing we can do is save posts. Never mind liking, hearting, wowing, caring, s- celebrating, commenting. commenting. <laughs> no, now we all have to do saving. There's never, there's never, we've never figured it out. There's always the next thing to do. Um, but Natalie, if you can stick around, we have one more topic to get to before we uh, talk to Tamar. I just want to uh, tell you guys, speaking of social media, I found the Chrissy Teigen t- tweet, so I feel like now we can move on. We can talk about gene therapy. Okay, cool. Good. I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, only it took I'm sure our two. listeners, it took, yeah, I'm sure it took them as much time. It's, it's cool. We're all on this journey together. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So our next topic, our final topic before the interview, non-viral gene therapy shows promise in hemophilia A animal models so uh here's the the 10,000 foot view and as i think amy and i say quite often and we still have to do this for the vwd guidelines we haven't forgotten but we do want to have good credible experts come on to talk more about this stuff but while it's news uh here is the high level overview so there's a company called generation bio in fact last year they raised 110 million dollars as i believe part of their round c funding to do what they've now started to report data on having done, which is using a closed-ended DNA. So as opposed to using a virus, um, you've heard us talk about AAV, the adeno-associated virus, and how that is a vector commonly being used in gene transfer. Well, this form of gene therapy, as we've also discussed, gene therapy is just kind of a big umbrella term, captures a lot of stuff. So this form of gene therapy is using closed-ended DNA that's delivered via a cell-targeted lipid nanoparticle system. And of course, we all know all about that. So the company has reported, though, that they've administered this um, this system to mice that are engineered to mimic s- symptoms of hemophilia A. Unfortunately, mice are often the target at these early pl- preclinical uh, levels. So we've talked about in clinical trials, before you even get to human clinical trials, there are non-human studies. And that's the phase of development that Generation Bio is in. So these mice that were given um, uh, gene therapy via this closed-ended DNA technique, uh, there was a group given 0.5 milligrams per kilo, and they had a factor eight expression of 9% after 10 days. There was a dose of one milligram per kilo, and they had 16% after nine days, and two milligrams per kilo, and they had 23% after nine days. There have also been some studies done with uh, the factor nine protein with this company and there's some additional data that's presented as uh, relates to that but the most kind of catching is the ones that i just pr- provided you so one milligram per kilo 16 percent two milligrams per kilo 23 percent half a milligram per kilo nine percent after 10 days so what does this mean well it means that the study and the, the research gets to continue. So uh, I, in reading the article, there was a statement from the company. They do intend to initiate their clinical trial program later this year. So the data that they are collecting in the mice models and in the non-human primate models, all of it thus far is on track so that they could start their phase one clinical trial earlier, uh, later this year. Now, as we know, Clinical trials have three phases. There's extensions. Sometimes you submit after your third phase, and the FDA says we need two more years of data. So what does this mean for the future of our treatment immediately from a patient perspective? Not much. But what I think is important to remember, and it goes back to something that uh, Brian O'Mahony talked about last week with gene therapy, and that is the uh, the buyer's remorse, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Gene therapy for all intents and purposes, is a one and done, and should be thought of that way. Should be thought of Mm -hmm. as a one and done, because you may never be able to get another kind of gene therapy again. So I think it's very important for someone who is considering what their options are to be aware that as much as we're talking about gene therapy right now, and when we're talking about it right now, we're generally, again, talking about viral gene therapy, AAV vector gene therapy. There are other forms being worked on. It's not as far along as AAV, which is why you don't hear about it as much. But I guess the thing I'm really trying to impart 
and I'd be curious, Amy, Natalie, to hear if you have thoughts on this. Sometimes I feel as a patient, when there's a, a new product coming out, when there's new science that's exciting, that's interesting, that's got a lot of buzz, I almost feel as though I'm kind of like just momentously being pushed towards it, even if I'm not necessarily like seeking a change in my regimen or my treatment. And I am very sensitive to gene therapy kind of having that energy around it where it just seems as though it's the inevit inevitable tidal wave. And maybe in 20 years it is, but in 2021, we have zero FDA approved products and we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's being worked on that is not as far along or as headliney grabbing as AAV. And I think it's important for people to keep that in perspective, to know there are more options being developed. We just might have to be a bit patient. I agree. And I think it, um, it just goes to prove again that science is becoming more and more important um, as you know we continue to develop in this community of what is happening and to realize that science takes a long, long, long time. And you know, patience, um, expectation management, um, but just to keep you know yourselves informed. I, you know, this one of the things I love about you in particular, Patrick, is that you are so Tell me. Um, <laughs> drawn to this type of stuff. I mean, I, I find myself not wanting to, to engage with it until it's like a done deal. And I think it just might be a personality thing of like, oh, mm. that, that freaks me out. I don't want to, um, it's almost like my expectation management. I know sure. I'm going to be disappointed. So I just want to like step away. And I'm sure there's, you know, it's a it's a scale of things and i just love that you push into it i love that we can bring this to listeners um so we can just follow along and it's it's exciting there's so much stuff happening in hemophilia i mean that that's the thing that i keep it's like the only thing that i know for sure is that there's so <laughs> much ideating about about hemophilia and it's really exciting for the community i you know when i was listening to you say this i was just thinking like right now is a cool time in science just in period because with covid i feel like the average person like has said in their household mrna viral vector dna like th these these words that aren't thrown around in non-science households are now being thrown around in every household because there's something going on that affects not just people with bleeding disorders but all people right. so i think what's cool is the interest in this science uh, around covid probably like allows people to feel a little bit more secure in in reading these other things and i know i'm not saying the vaccine or that is similar to what uh, right. gene therapy is but just these terms that might make people insecure or turned off from learning more are front page of the new york times right now are right. you know their science science is getting uh it's, it's moment in the sun. And I think that only helps our community um, feel a little bit more comfortable to dive into what, what are these um, options? What is AAV? What are the other options coming down the line? So that gets me excited too, that I think that people um, might be a little less like intimidated or a little less scared to um, learn more. For sure. For sure. And at the same time, to tie that too to something Amy said, that which is on the market is that which is most important to understand and know about and consider. That which is maybe in phase three clinical trial is next most important to consider. Phase two, next. Phase one, after that. Preclinical, after that. You know, so you do, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a uh, quote unquote bad thing if someone sees an article like this and is like, wait, this is preclinical trial. Never mind. I think even Dr. Sedonio, when we had him on, uh, Amy, toward the end of the year, was talking about sort of like to help yourself, like narrowing the prism to that which is like immediately on the horizon. And I think there's there's that's a good line of thinking. But at the same time, there is this other stuff going on. And I think for gene therapy in particular, because of how much we talk about it, but because of how much we talk about it with actually a pretty narrow definition of it in mind, it's just important to remember there are things that are coming. So if you do want to read on, there's a link in the program notes, non-viral gene therapy shows promise in hemophilia A 
animal models. We've also reached out to Generation Bio to see if we can get their chief medical officer or someone with um, expertise to come onto Bloodstream and talk to us about what they're doing, how it differs from viral gene therapy, and what else we might be able to kind of uh, keep an eye out for in the near future. So hopefully we'll have that to bring to you in the next few weeks here. Um, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, stay tuned for Tamar Mitchell, because this guy has got a lot of musical talent, a very musical family, and I'll be honest, I'm a little jealous. You'll understand why in a moment. Amy and I are now joined by community member Tamar Mitchell. Hey, Tamar, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. I was actually just uh, joking with uh, Tamar before we put re hit record that I've seen his picture the last number of years connected to the article in Hemaware. So it's like I've kind of felt like I've known you maybe a little bit, but really not at all. But it's nice to actually now have a re Oh, no, now I know you. Now I can say yeah. I know you. <laughs> um, so just to jump right into it, Tamar, um, you are a part of a, a big family with a number of people who have severe hemophilia and for whom music is a major part of life. So a number of things I want to dig into there. But the first is you're one of seven, four of whom have severe hemophilia A, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Is that right? Yep. So, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm just curious, like in a family of seven where you have four who have a severe bleeding disorder, three who don't, like wh what are those dynamics? And I know you're kind of like toward the older end of the pack, so I'm sure that yeah. plays into it. But just, yeah, some insight into like growing up in that household and how the bleeding disorder piece kind of played out. Well, at first I was started with my um, my older brother uh, that passed away. Um, I, we believe that he had like a, um, a bleeding that he had hemophilia first. Um, he had a blood blood clot on his hand, which made him like, you know, pass away. Um, I think it was like three months. He was like three months old. But after that, like uh, they found out I had hemophilia like um, because I was uh, circumcised and then like it was a lot of blood um, coming out in my pamper. So sure, yeah. In the hospital, yeah, and stuff like that. So it was just, um, it was new for all of us. Um, my mom, she was just getting used to like taking us to the, to the hospital um, at a young age. Um, so you were the first to be diagnosed then? Yeah, yeah, I was the first, first. But we figure your brother probably had it, but you were the one that was first diagnosed. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so your mom was just at first trying to get used to what does it mean to be a part of this new world. Right, yeah. Okay, and then when did your, what's, who came after you and how, how long after? It was like two years after then my, um, my other younger brother came um, and he had, what was it? He had a head injury. Um, I think, mm. no, he had surgery on his head at a young age and then so it was like a problem with that um as well as my other brother that came after him it was like two years two years like after all okay of and then uh once he came um they was pretty much um the same um as far as like blood type and stuff like that and then once my younger brother came he was more like me like just um, the athletic type, um, just growing up. It, it was literally like the spinning in, image of me, like the youngest, really? youngest. Yeah, it was crazy. So did you find not just with him, uh, but with all of your younger siblings and especially those who also have hemophilia, did you take on kind of a, a mentor role as older brother? Uh, a little bit. I had to uh, learn um, pretty much the hard way. Cause like I was I was hard headed to um, like playing sports and stuff like that. Cause I I wanted to you know I wouldn't say normal, but like I wanted to you know just not have nothing like hinder me from doing things. So yeah, sure. So yeah, like I would I would play uh, football like street football. Um, uh oh. With cousins and stuff like that. So I was I was just I was just out there like that. I'm not saying I was bad, but like I was just not listening to the fact that I had hemophilia and I um, sure. could like really be injured. So like every time afterwards, I have to take my medicine because I'll be hurt. So it was just like, <laughs> was, was there a wake like, up call right. moment or were you just yeah. like, all right, I, I, this is just too much. Like what, what changed that for you? It was um 
pretty much like when once I got older, um, going into high school, I had to learn like like this is a part of me, and I gotta be okay with you know what I'm saying just me being, I mean not not wanting to be hurt all the time, and then like try, looking at them so they can um, you know basically have a role model role model in that area like just saying like you can do things a certain way but you can't do you know like everything you know what i'm saying or you just right. got to be careful about what you're doing so yeah what was the dynamic like with your siblings that were not affected by hemophilia did you get was there any friction about you know who got more attention or you know what was that dynamic like uh not really like my older brother he was always like um the oldest out of all of us he was um he was always just supportive like we would always sometimes bump heads like all of us we would fight because it was like you know we we brothers so <laughs> <That's yeah. cool. laughs> like we was um you know like fight in a playful way sometimes or you know serious it, it, yeah it was it was fun. wait are all 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 seven boys are there any no, girls it's, um it's one girl she um she don't one have one girl yeah <laughs> Wow, she's got protection. <laughs> I would love to meet her. I bet she is yeah. incredible. <laughs> but yeah, she uh, she she never had problems with us either. It's like she uh, um, always bump heads with the youngest because um, he always like tempt her and stuff like that. But yeah, but yeah, she she held her own. Um, just being okay with us, you know, having hemophilia. Like we was always aware of like not taking it too far so so yeah so it was like always that that boundary that we had um, between each other so did music become something that you were able to focus on in lieu of sports i know it's been in your life a long time but you know kind of give us a sense of how maybe music like what's the role it's had in your life and has that changed during different points in your life yeah um at first like for me it was like sports because at times when I would be hurting, um, I would look I would look for things to like cheer me up, and basically like I I played not at a young age like when I was like real young they'll sing to me um, like these different songs and then I just be feeling like better in a way um, not physically but like mentally so yeah and I think uh, I read Lean on Me was one of the songs is that right Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it was uh tomorrow, um, by Annie. It was the in the sun will come the out end. tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cause they they sing sing that to me um when I was like a baby, like but I remember like them singing it. It was crazy, but yeah. Um, well, you gave I me an idea like actually when I was reading that uh, ahead of this because you know my my wife is uh is thirty five weeks pregnant. One of the things they talk about is sing even now like the baby can hear you and if you sing songs now and the baby's a newborn they recognize those songs they'll calm them down and of course you know it's like it's the same as like when i go to karaoke you know hey do you want to sing a song it's like oh, okay and immediately i forget every song i've ever heard in my entire life i cannot remember one song in the world and i thought the same thing when it was like oh yeah we should sing to the baby yeah. uh, and I couldn't think of anything. So as I've been here, I'm like, oh, lean on me. That's a perfect song. Oh, tomorrow, a great song. So I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank your family for these ideas because I'm going to bring them forward literally today. <laughs> yeah, that was like, that was yeah, pretty much how all of us um, transition um, like into music. Well, um, our uncles, like when we would go to like family events, um, like say for Christmas, um, like if we go to my um, dad's side of the family, well, first we go to my dad's side of the family and then we go to my um, my mom's side. And in both sides, like they, um, all of our uncles, they um, they play instruments or sing. So like on Christmas, on Christmas day, um, they would, like we'll have a piano, um, one family is sing and we'll just be listening. Or like on my mom's side, they uh they used to like have the whole setup downstairs in the basement and like they'd play guitar and all that like throughout the whole 
the whole um, Christmas, you know, day experience. So it was just like, it was like growing up in that atmosphere was like definitely changed us to um, push more towards music than uh, what we was already doing. Like, and I had got injured um, in, in uh, track and which led me to like get more serious with my music. So it was like, that was the transition for me. And what did it look like as you started to get more serious? What steps were you taking to, you know, quote unquote, take it more seriously? I started to um, really just take the the life lesson I learned from track and then put it into my music by like singing more. I started singing more and started actually like really practicing on the uh, piano. Like I already had a um, like a teacher that was in the mist, but like, I didn't take it serious. Like mm. I didn't, yeah, I didn't take that serious until um, that happened. Then I started writing more um, as far as like writing my own music because I felt like my writing ability was like better than everything. But I mm. wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that now because it's okay. like, I'm like growing in all stages. So it's like, yeah. Do you ever, so all, all seven of you are musical as well, right? Except um, Uh-oh. the one that's under, well, yeah, yeah, we actually are. Except my uh, sister a little bit. Like she don't, she sing in a choir. Well, she used to sing pre-COVID. Um, she used to sing in a choir, but she's like more into like art. So it's like she draws and stuff like that. So do you ever collaborate with your siblings? Like you meant when, you, when you're writing a song or do, have you ever worked with any of your siblings on, on original material? Yeah, yeah, we uh we used to perform together. Um, when I had shows, I would instead of ask musicians around Chicago, I ask um, them first to see if they're free. Tomorrow, you mentioned that writing was so important to you, and um, you feel like uh you enjoy writing. What what does it mean to express yourself through writing, and what does what does it unlock within you that that creative path? Yeah, I take writing like very serious. It's um, like, as far as like unlocking, I, um, I try to reach people in different ways. Like um, sometimes like I drop nuggets in my song, in my songs, like uh, if I'm trying to get them closer to a certain, you know, like a certain atmosphere or something like that. I don't know, I feel like I'm in control when I'm right, when I'm writing and I feel like I can control the atmosphere as um, like someone that's listening to it. Like if I want them to, you know, show their expressions to their certain part- partner, uh, I put it in a way to where they, um, you know, want to feel loved or something like that. So yeah, it's just, yeah, I put a lot into it, a lot of thought into it. Oh man, I just got goosebumps at that, that that's where you find the control is amazing. And who are your favorite artists, like in terms of like lyrical work? Like who are the people that you want to emulate? Um, John Legend, uh, I listen to a lot. Um, I like his uh, writing as well as um, one of my favorite artists is uh, Prince. And I uh, study him, like I study his, uh, his um, live performances as well as like his songs that he, that he write. But his, his songs is like more for like, um, the older audience and what I'm aiming for is like the teens. So I'm like in that area. So actually on that, uh, like trying to reach teens, I had read that you wanted to use your voice to try to help, especially people with bleeding disorders and young people. I'm, I'm curious, what, what are you thinking about along those lines? What, what kind of goals do you have and, and what are you doing right now to move toward those? Oh, uh, well, actually right now I'm working, the project I'm working on is called the love house um and it's an ep and it's it's pretty much like relating to how relationships are in 2020 like as a um young adult so like you you know having a best friend like one of my songs is called best friend that song in particular like it's it's just about like how you consider your best friend to be someone that you can possibly date and that is the norm um i feel like because I've seen it so much um, in today's time. So I was just like, yeah, that's a very relatable topic. Like if I, um, I try to pinpoint things that's like very relatable. 
um, in today's time so that the younger audience could like, you know, catch. And some, I would add like some old stuff in there, um, like from my research from like when I, well, yeah, when I was like early in college, so yeah. And where are you now actually? Are you, have you graduated or are you in college? No, I'm uh, in Columbia, Columbia College, uh, downtown Chicago. Gotcha, okay. And would you have a projected graduation date? Uh, it's, it was supposed to be this, this, um, this year, but I, I had gotten into like a bad car accident. So I have to wait. Oh, till no. next. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm all good. I, it was just, it was crazy. Like my car has stopped and then somebody hit me from, um, behind when I was on the side of the road. So it was just like, Jeez. terrifying to be in a position where you're like, I'm not, uh, I'm stopped. I'm not even moving. Like there's nothing I can really do. I'm just sitting here. And yeah. to be hit, like, what a frightening experience. I was just going to ask what your thought process was with hemophilia during that car accident. What, like, what layer did that? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of like a depressing time for me. It took some time for me to, like, come back to myself. Because um, I started thinking, like, how I used to think uh, when I was younger. And I was like, I can't, I can't think like that. Um, like, what know, kind of way? just depressing like like why you know what i'm saying like asking why why do i have hemophilia and why um you know like just why everything i was like i can't think like that um because the way that um i was taught like younger like growing up um and trying to teach my uh brothers like not to down what you have like to be acceptable of like who you are so me just uh, thinking like that, I was just like, um, maybe I don't love myself or something like that. Like that's, that's the type of energy that, like I was feeding myself and I had to like take a break and like reevaluate myself. So it was just like, it was a heavy time, so yeah. Did you write? Yeah, yeah I, I, was, write, I was writing a lot um, during that time. Um, I, I got like a couple of songs um, I wrote and uh, actually recorded. And some of those songs are going to be on the EP um, as well. When is the EP? Do you have a release date for that? Uh, not exactly. Like I'm still, because um, I, I plan on having like a um, visual EP. Like I know, i never seen that being done. Like I heard of visual albums, but like a visual EP is just like visual for every song. Um, and I plan on like having it done sometime in February, but if not February, then the next month for sure. So it's just like, it's just that, that time frame, like, and then getting everything in order, like texting people. Like, yeah. It's not. <laughs> How many people are you working That's with? That's what on the it? biz is. Yeah. Texting people. Nonstop texting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um. One person I'm, well, I'm working with like um, three people, no, four people. That's like my top, top people. My manager, um, as well as like my uh, co-worker, like he's uh, like my business partner, basically. And like he, uh, he helps me out with like thinking, basically. Like, <laughs> yeah. Thinking my practice, like helping out with just like processing things. Like if, if something don't work, then he'll, you know, help me out with another path to go. So yeah, and then um, the producers I work with is some people that is like very important that I put on the top of my list. Um, and then like the people under them is like the dancers and uh, other singers, like singers that I work with, so yeah. A lot of coordinating. Like, I don't know if people realize how much coordination and planning and logistics, it's like so much stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and, and because like I'm not um, a big artist um, yet, it's like yet I'm trying to like yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm trying to like just really plan it out um, to where I can get noticed um, the right mm -hmm. way. So I was just like, mm -hmm. I gotta I gotta like really do this the right way, basically. So yeah. I've been working on this for a while, so I can't wait, can't wait.
It's cool. It's cool. I can, you know, uh, the listeners can probably hear it in your voice. I could see it in your face as you're talking, like the the excitement, the anticipation, the. And I'm not a I'm not a musical person or producer, um, but I do I am a producer, so I do know that it takes a long time to get to that finished product. So I recognize that face. I recognize that energy. Um, so good for you, and like very exciting. It's it's February is around the around the corner, and. I think yeah. you said that's when you hope to have the the visual piece anyway available. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. yeah. If not, um, if not, the whole project will be done by February. Definitely, the uh, promo video should be done. So that's what I'm aiming for. Like, if not the whole project, then that because I still haven't got it like mixed and mastered. Tomorrow, can we follow you on Instagram? Where can our listeners and me? I want to follow you on Instagram. That's got to be the place, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh yes. my main platform. But uh tomorrow the one is the tomorrow the number one. Tomorrow the one. Following you right now, buddy. Uh, tomorrow, if it's okay with you and if we um if we can do so, you know, I'd love as the as the episode ends here after our interview to uh go out on Life Begins and to kind of end the episode playing that song if if uh if that would be okay with you. Uh, so one, would that be okay with you? And two, could you tell us a little bit about that song so that people can understand some of the context before they hear it? Yeah, so um, this song, uh, Life Begins, um, it was pretty much like, you know, like a breaking point as to who I was, like just transitioning to a better self. And like that whole EP was just like explaining that. And like my transition as to how I was thinking, um, it was like very depressing from the the top of it that was dealing with uh, hemophilia too. Um, it was just like a whole transition as to me becoming who I am now. So it was just like, yeah, it was a it was a lot. It was a lot into that that I put into that. That's why I say it was um, like from the beginning. I said it was um, a personal project, um, and some of those songs I would take out. Uh, just because of like the production side of things. So yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, Life Begins, we'll play it directly following this interview. It's Tamar, T-A-M-A-R, the one, number one on Instagram. If you want to follow Tamar there, Tamar the one. And when that video is ready, please do ping one of us over here and let us know. We'll be sure to share it out through Bloodstream Media and do whatever we can to help amplify its release. Oh yeah, I do have a, a video already out. Um, it's called Secret. Um, I'm featured on it. Um, and that's something that you guys could check out. So, yeah. Cool. All right. We'll put a link to that in the program notes then as well. Um, and Tamar, thank you for making time for us pretty quickly here as well. Um, very exciting seeing where you're at. Keep us, you know, keep us posted and good luck, man. You're doing awesome stuff. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Tamar. Tamar Mitchell. You can read his article in Hemaware. You'll find a link to that in the program notes, or you can Google Tamar Mitchell Hemophilia. That's how I originally found it, and that will bring you to it as well. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Great to finally meet you, and I'm excited to see uh, what else he does with his musical career. Hey, and stick around for next week. We have um, the host and the creative director and the writer and the director of The Pain Pod. Mel Forrest is going to be with us next week. The Pain Pod, of course, is our series on chronic pain. And this season is going to be incredible. Seven episodes, uh, patient story-based, um, has a foundation in story, um, people's lives with chronic pain, how they've overcome. And it's going to be great. So stick around next week so you can hear a little bit more about season two of the pain pod and if you haven't already listened season one is available now you can find the pain pod or pain podcast google pain podcast bloodstream or go to bloodstreammedia.com and follow the links to the show make sure to subscribe to the pain pod as well as to bloodstream as well as flow cheat codes you know everything that bloodstream media does as long as you're in a subscribing mode Thank you, Amy. Thank you to producer Greg, as always, and the Bloodstream team for making this happen. Thank you, Natalie, for joining us for this episode. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks again to Mar. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Kata for being the presenting sponsor of the Bloodstream podcast, BleedingDisorders.com, to learn more. And with that, that is all for this episode. 
Do you have a bleeding disorder or health topic that you'd like to hear us discuss? Is there an expert or a guest that you're just dying to hear from? Want to inquire about casting opportunities for Bloodstream and Believe Limited seemingly endless number of projects that are going on all the time? Well, you can email us, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or connect with Bloodstream Media on social media. You'll find Bloodstream Media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or you can follow Amy Board, Natalie Lynch, or Patrick James Lynch on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or LinkedIn. Shout out to all the committed LinkedIn users out there. Huh? Check out the program notes for this episode in your podcast player or on bloodstreammedia.com where you'll find the links and information related to the stories and segments featured on this episode. I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am that other host, Amy Board. And I am the sometimes voice, Natalie Lynch. <laughs> the sometimes voice. And until next time, <laughs> take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. I'm a cool guy, nice guy, nice guy. Flipping vegan burgers while I'm in the sunshine time. Never worried and never trying to waste time. Put you all up in your feels as I head over. Eating the orange, trying not to brain joke. Having a but if not kind of attitude. Putting my faith in my fears so it dissipate. Elevating my mind to let it resonate. I shame it all. Them girls, them girls. Them girls, them girls. They claim my world. Them girls, them girls. Them girls, them girls. That change my world. I've never been the one to lie. I've never been the one to cry. Putting the shame on you for let my heart turn blue. As deep as the ocean, you know what it do. Calm and relaxing, never lacking. Oh, maybe it's black, I got the hat to match in. Oh, on the ends of my soul, that's way too old. Reaching for a cane as I feel the pain. Clenching my hands as I make it rain. I am building my pride, building my life. Got rid of folks hating on the way that I dress, folks hating on the way that I stand, folks hating on the way that I am, folks hating on the way that I do my dance, roll my pants, raise my hand. For the people out there, for the people out there that's listening, for the people out there, for the people out there that's running, for the people out there, for the people out there. Home in the hair for the people out there, for the people out there going green for the air. Showing you that I care, showing you there's love around here. That's only on a good day, moving on like Badu on a good day. I remember being scared to talk about what I don't like, don't like, reflecting my day on being uptight, uptight. Bad things come back to me, back to me. True things come naturally, naturally. Seems refill with me. I am building my pride, building my life.